On 16th of April each year, people around the world recognise the anniversary of the battle at Culloden. This battle ended the rising led by Charles Edward Stuart and had profound implications in Scotland and elsewhere. If you ever have the chance to be at Culloden on the nearest Saturday to the 16th of April, please join us. The gathering that morning, the emotion and the history are worth sharing. In previous episodes, we followed the events from 1689 through several Jacobite risings and heard how, in July 1745, Charles Edward Stuart left France to travel to Scotland. He gathered his supporters and, having avoided the government army of General Cope, travelled as far south as Perth. In September, he entered Edinburgh and later that month, his army finally came face to face with Cope and his forces and defeated them decisively at Preston Pans. Having moved into England late in 1745, the Jacobite army travelled as far south as Derby, within four to six days from London, before deciding to turn north and head back to Scotland, arriving there just before Christmas of 1745. Now back in the centre of Scotland, and with a large government force gathering on the border, Charles Edward Stuart and his advisers had some difficult decisions to make. But before we consider these, most of you, I'm sure, are familiar with the British National Anthem, or at least with the first verse. How many are aware that in 1745 a new verse was added? It goes like this. And don't worry, I'm not going to sing. Lord, grant that martial word may, by thy mighty aid, victory bring. May he sedition crush, and like a torrent rush, rebellious Scots to crush. God save the king. This was not widely used, and it soon disappeared from the anthem. And of course, there was an alternative verse proposed by Jacobites. God bless the prince, I pray. God bless the prince, I pray. Charlie, I mean. That Scotland we may see, freed from vile presbytery, both George and his fecky, ever so, amen. Fecky seems to be a derogatory nickname for George's eldest son, the Prince of Wales, Frederick. Now, neither of these verses were, of course, officially part of the anthem. But by the beginning of 1746, Hanoverian supporters throughout the country must have thought that their wishes, expressed in their additional verse, had been granted. For the army of Charles Edward Stuart had, re had retreated into Scotland, the threat to London had disappeared, and the government army, now under the command of the King's second son, the Duke of Cumberland, was encamped on the border of England and Scotland and had now organised itself into a far larger force than had been seen in Britain for many years. At the beginning of January 1746, Charles Edward Stuart was with his main army around Glasgow and beginning an advance towards Stirling. Now, bearing in mind that Stirling provided the first crossing of the River Forth between there and the North Sea, its strategic position allowed Charles a choice of next steps. They could stay where they were, wait for reinforcements from Scotland, or even perhaps from France. Advance on Edinburgh, or head north to the Highlands. No doubt, as before, there were differing views expressed among the Jacobite leadership. More soldiers were arriving from the northeast. Lord John Drummond was on his way not only with some local recruits, but also with 800 experienced men of the Irish Brigade. These soldiers, part of the French army, had arrived from France late in 1745. Many of them had been at the Battle of Fontenoy, where they had been instrumental in defeating the British army led by the Duke of Cumberland. 
They were destined to play a role in the later battles of the Rising, including at Falkirk and in April 1746 at Culloden. The French government, having abandoned their recent invasion plans, were still sending money and arms, landing them on the northeast coast of Scotland when they were able to avoid the patrols of the Royal Navy. Small numbers of soldiers were also landed, although many of them were quickly captured. On the 3rd of January, advancing Jacobite forces surrounding, st surrounded Stirling and began to set up a siege. The town quickly surrendered, but the castle, which had been heavily reinforced in December, did not. Because of its position, this created difficulties for the Jacobites, as it had months ago when they were travelling south towards England. By the middle of January, the Jacobite army had grown again following the reduction as they had retreated from Derby. They now numbered somewhere between eight and 9,000 men around Stirling and some two to 3,000 elsewhere. As for the Hanoverians at the start of January 1746, their major force had left the Carlisle area and travelled north towards Glasgow and Stirling. They had been increased in number by men from Corps Army who would fought at Preston Pans, and no doubt some of them were released prisoners who would probably given their parole never to fight again against the Jacobites. In addition, they were joined by 12 companies of Argyle Militia and volunteers from Glasgow, Paisley, Edinburgh and also from the north coast of Scotland. In the east, there was a move to protect Edinburgh with more troops and some changes in personnel. General Cope was now not in favour following the defeat at Preston Pans, and Marshal Wade had twice failed to intercept the Jacobite army as they travelled down to Derby and back again. So General Hawley was appointed Commander-in-Chief of Government Forces in Scotland. Now Hawley was an older man, being one of the few remaining who had fought against the Jacobites in the 1715 Rising. He hastened to Edinburgh, arriving there on January the 6th. And the forces in Edinburgh were increased by two regiments of regular infantry and some volunteers. The other significant government force in Scotland was the 64th Highlanders, supplemented by militia and volunteers from the northern clans. But in early January, they were isolated in and around Inverness. And the Duke of Cumberland, in charge of the entire army, was at this stage heading south, having been recalled by his father, King George, for fear of needing to protect London from a French invasion. By the middle of the month, Hawley started to move significant forces to the relief of Stirling and control of the critical crossing of the Forth. Learning of this, the Jacobites turned east to meet him, a meeting which was destined to take place on a moor just outside Falkirk. The battle at Falkirk Moor was the second major confrontation between the armies of the Hanoverian government and that of Charles Edward Stuart's Jacobites. Second of only three, Preston Pans in September 1745 was the first, and of course Culloden in April 1746 was destined to be the final tragic third. Now in review of the month of January 1746, we will not go into great detail about the battle. There are plenty of books describing this and the other battles. But in summary, the Jacobites arriving from the direction of Stirling at about 5,800 infantry and some 360 cavalry. The government forces had about the same number of foot soldiers, but over twice as many horsemen. The Jacobites were led by Lord George Murray and the government troops by the recently arrived General Hawley. Now some stories have Hawley arriving late to the battle site, having been held up, it is said, by his time taking dinner with Lady Kilmarnock. This good lady was the wife of William Boyd, Earl of Kilmarnock, who was serving as a colonel in Prince Charles's army 
One may wonder if the delay was at dinner was a deliberate act by the lady. Boyd himself, later captured by government forces, was tried as a traitor and executed in London in August 1746. When Hawley did take command, he sent three regiments of dragoons to take some high ground and deny it the Jacobites. There they would be supported by a large infantry force. It seems that some two-thirds of this force consisted of men who months before had suffered defeat at Preston Pans and remember the impact of the Highland Charge. As the first mass volley of fire came from the Jacobites, the front of the Hanoverian force turned to run and collided with those still moving into position. The Jacobites followed up their success with a charge by the Macdonalds and almost in an instant, Hawley's centre and left flank were broken and in retreat. On the government right, the Jacobites were held up by a ravine and an exchange of musket fire followed. In the front ranks of the Jacobites were the men from the Irish Brigade mentioned earlier. It did not take long for the remainder of the government forces, perhaps seeing the retreat to their left, to begin to flee. The second major battle between Jacobites and government troops had ended in the same way as the first, with the Jacobite victory and the government in retreat. Some 350 government soldiers were killed, about 300 captured or injured. Jacobite casualties were much smaller. Following their defeat at Falkirk Moor, Hawley sent most of his remaining force back to Edinburgh, for it was expected that that would be the Jacobites' next target. He also continued to earn his reputation as a hard man and organised military tribunals to assign blame for the outcome of the battle. At least four men were executed. No wonder he acquired the nickname Hangman Hawley. Another government defeat had sent shockwaves through London, so General Cope was dispatched to take over from Hawley. And having decided that the French invasion was now less of a threat, the Duke of Cumberland was sent north later in the month. When he arrived, it had become clear that rather than heading to Edinburgh, Charles Edward Stuart and his army had turned west again and were returning towards Stirling. On the 31st of January, Cumberland marched out of Edinburgh with a sizeable force en route to Linlithgow and then he planned to relieve the siege of Stirling Castle. Now it's possible that following their victory at Falkirk, the Jacobites could have taken Edinburgh. There was certainly some panic in the city when the news of the government defeat reached there and as we've heard, Hawley rushed men to Edinburgh in anticipation. But the importance of the strategic bridge at Stirling, and therefore of the castle, still held by government troops, drew Charles back in that direction. Controlling the lowest bridge crossing of the River Forth provided the Jacobites with a route for more recruits, or if they so chose, of a clear passage to the Highlands. By the time they reached Stirling, their numbers were dwindling. Some clansmen were now heading home perhaps with spoils of war, but also in the middle of winter to check on their families in their homelands. No doubt many intended to return to Charles's side. Some did before Culloden. Others were still en route to rejoin in mid-April, but that's a story for later. There was also the perpetual problem of feeding a large army. So many men had been sent out into the area around Stirling to gather provisions. The siege of the castle at Stirling continued, but lacking large siege guns, the Jacobites were always going to find it difficult to do anything other than starve the garrison into surrender. Furthermore, the guns in the castle were able to fire onto the surrounding soldiers. This particularly created casualties among the experienced Irish brigades, who, faced with the reluctance of the Highlanders to dig ditches, were given that job. 
and were therefore very exposed. It's said that so many died that bodies were simply thrown into the river. Later in the month, news reached the besieging force that Cumberland was in Edinburgh and that Hawley and Cope were ready to leave the capital and advance west. So on the 29th, the siege was lifted. The army of Charles Edward Stuart crossed the River Forth, started their movement north and east into those areas where support was still expected. The outcome of the Battle of Falkirk Moor was not really decisive and the two armies had drawn apart. But what if the Jacobites had decided to pursue the government army towards Edinburgh and perhaps defeated them? Their enemy had been broken by the Highland charge and panicked into retreat. If Hawley's army was again defeated, would the government have offered a settlement? Or was that unlikely? As by this time, the government had returned some 7,000 experienced troops from the continent and secured the support of some five regiments from Hesse. Many of the Jacobite soldiers wanted desperately to go home and it was reported some of them fell to looting and desertion. Would their numbers and discipline have been strong enough for another major battle? Questions never answered at the time. As it was, at the end of January 1746, the government army, now clearly under the control of the Duke of Cumberland, was marching towards Stirling, soon to learn that the Jacobites had left and were now north of the river. The Jacobites, led by Charles Edward Stuart, with reducing numbers, were moving northeast. Would their numbers gain, grow again now that they were back in the Highlands? Would the French finally provide some significant help in addition to their money and arms? When and where would the armies again meet in battle? The story continues in our presentation covering February and March of 1746.